All right, I don't know if uh, any of you had a chance to look at this plot prior to right now or not, or this is it. All right, um, my name is Brian Politrick. I'm the uh, sales agronomist for North Star Seed, which is a forage company. Uh, head office out of uh, Winnipeg or Nipah, Manitoba. Uh, we cover the western part of the province in terms of retail forage sales. Uh, most of our uh, sales are through dealers like Karen Murray, who is our uh, independent dealer here. So I basically look after uh, British Columbia, part of southwest Saskatchewan, and Red Deer South. Um, so I would have about 34, 36 dealers that I that I work with, um, as well as offer agronomic advice to producers related to forage, um, uh, corn as well, and, and of course cover crops, of, which have been kind of uh, the latest craze. Uh, you know, and I'm, um, <clears throat> there's lots of people selling cover crops. I guess North Star Seed has been in it for about uh, seven years. And really the whole idea of cover crops started, or, or polycropping, uh, started with, um, for us anyway, with the feeding of, of um, wildlife. And so, so some of our blends were actually designed and, and, and named that way. Uh, the last five years we've got a lot more serious in regards to polycropping, and especially in the last two to three years. Uh, we continually look for new varieties. Um, and some of them are here today and we're going to talk about them. Uh, Karen has handed out a sheet that includes all of the cover crops and the majority of them that we cover or carry here today. And, and many of them we, I guess as a company, decided and, and our thought process was that we would like to custom design um, a polycrop scenario based on what your requirements are. We're of the opinion that, uh, that a stock blend uh, will not work for, for you. I mean, if you live in Morris, Manitoba, if you live in Fort St. John, BC, a stock blend will not perform the same in, in those three provinces. So that's why we, we basically uh, would prefer to design a program based on, on what your requirements are. On the back side of that sheet though, you will see four uh, programs that I put together. And, uh, and again, we'll alter them based on, on what you're after. In the cover crop business, there's been a lot of people have made some pretty serious claims in regards to uh, with the use of cover crops or polycropping, you no longer need to use fertilizer. Uh, you'll have super weed control so you can go the organic way. Um, I'm not sure that we're in a position to make those claims and, and I sure wouldn't. The same carries on that if you put on 200 or 250 grams of molasses on an acre, um, you know, you're going to see a, a, a big boost. Or if you spray sea salt on, uh, there's no requirement for fertilizer. So those are things you kind of have to watch for and, and I guess make up your own mind and, and do a little work and, and see if that works for you. I'm a cattle producer as well. Um, I run on both range. I have irrigated. And I played with cover crops. And, and when I look at cover cropping, uh, the big benefit that I see in terms of of, um, of, of the perfect window for us is, is to be able to double crop. So whether we take a silage crop off or we take a green feed crop off, this allows us the opportunity to go back and, and utilize our land instead of letting it sit idle. Um, however, as you look a little deeper into uh, the possibilities, uh, I've had people that have been growing hard wheat or spring wheat and they put clovers in for two reasons. One is to add the nitrogen fixation. The second was to try to get uh, some fall pasture. And, and so actually out of that experiment that we did a couple of years ago and that on a field scale basis, uh, and it, it was 640 acres, we used two types of clover. And from that, we determined A, that crimson clover was not a worker for us in terms of uh, fall pasture. B, we liked brassim clover. It gave us lots, lots of top biomass, but but it was affected by the frost. So with that, we went to work and, and we found uh, a product that we believe is gonna work and that's this one in front of us and we'll talk a little more about it. Um, and of course, as you look to irrigation, uh, the polycropping looks a lot more attractive than what you see here today. Um, 
And again, you know, polycropping has really taken off over the last two to three years. But if you think back and look at the moisture levels we've had in the last two to three years, I wouldn't term that as being uh, an average for this area for sure, and even for the province in some locations. So, so there are some alternatives for sure, and, and I think we need to look at that. I mean, really, it started with the use of radish, uh, field radish or tillage radish and uh, you know a to break up the hard pan and, and do some other benefits and and then we carried it on the grazing uh, we saw that if we seeded it too early though we had it seeded out so we had some issues with that as well so so we refined our thought process uh, in terms of what we want to recommend so again when you look at polycropping cover crops to me is is the crop that you put in when you're establishing forage so but people often refer to these as cover crops. I prefer to refer to them as polycropping. So there definitely is a soil health benefit rather than leaving your soil idle. Uh, I think we all recognize that. Uh, weed control, definitely um, it'll assist depending on what you put in. All of these are monocultured. We could have put in a polyculture and you kind of get some indication of what happens at the back end here. And I'll talk about some of the seeding here and the mechanical issues, but it uh, just kind of gives you a visual picture. There's a lot to the nutritional value of these crops and how you utilize them. And so that's an important uh, deal as well. I guess, you know, when you talk about erosion control, uh, things have changed a lot, but when you talk about some of the specialty crops like potatoes, very often you'll fly on um, annual ryegrass or Italian annual rye just to control the erosion before digging. So there's, there's lots of potential uses. Really what we want to do is increase the soil um, uh, properties, uh, allow for better water infiltration, open up a hard pan if of course it is there, and allows you also some of these plants can, can definitely utilize and scavenge the nutrients that have been uh, either below the zone that's, that's used by by an oil seed or a, or a cereal crop. So there are some there are some definite benefits and of course the whole issue of, of grazing opportunities. Uh, trying to limit the, the amount of dollars we expend on our feed program and so you know does it make sense to bale up uh, a bunch of forage and then roll it back out or feed it back out when in fact you can have cattle do the work for you, spread out the manure and, and in essence, uh, save you some dollars. So that's really what it's all about. Okay, um, we're gonna start into the varieties. You see them on the back, or on the back side there is everything that we carry. We're just gonna highlight a few of them. When Karen and I looked at this, we thought we would bring to you some of what we think are, um, are some great possibilities for use in this area. We're gonna start on the product that's to your far left, and that's app and turnip. Um, app and turnip is, uh, is a great product to use in a forage type situation. Uh, it's bred really for multiple grazing use and, uh, and it's really anchored in the soil. So if you look at, at app and turnip uh, compared to purple top, purple top actually has a lot of growth on the top of the ground. And you'll get a, a tuber that's the size of a, uh, uh, basically a softball. And, yeah, you can. Yeah. Um, the for a see, he's going to actually put it to use for obvious. But these, of course, are, are not that way. The tuber will actually be below ground. It's a lot smaller tuber. And are we measuring these plots? No, no, okay. no, we're not. And so it. Yeah. So it remains a lot more anchored for grazing. And so when we look at, at uh, possible uh, scenarios in terms of putting something together, that's the kind of root system that we're after. Lots of top growth for grazing. So it's, it's, really, uh, it's really set up for multiple grazing use. Uh, and again, you wanna leave, it's like a solar panel. You wanna leave about four inches of growth as you rotate through your stand. And when we look at, at using any kind of these brassicas or so forth, we wanna be sure we probably don't exceed 50% of a brassica within a stand. And there's some reasons for that. One is the whole uh, idea of, as we get into some of the rapes, uh, we have issues with uric acid, uh, glucosinates, so it sets up a polio thing in cattle. Uh, so we've, we've combated that with some other varieties. You wanna feed a very balanced ration though. And so when you start to mix in some cool season and warm season grasses, you can in fact do that. 
and it, it provides, provides for a better rumen uh, environment within our beef cattle. So, so again, a very disciplined approach to how we, how we handle that. Leaves on the appen are very, very high um, in energy and low in fiber. So again, if you think about the rumen, you think about uh, nutrition in the beef cattle, very quick passage through the rumen. So you're wanting to slow it down with some grasses. And again, just more of a balanced, a balanced approach. Um, when you get to any of these broad leaves, uh, you see the damage on the leaves, that's flea beetles. So there, you have to be cognizant of, of surrounding populations and often when, um, when the canola is set blooming, depending when you get these seeded, you'll see a movement back into these kind of stands. So again, you know, you might have to look at matador or something like that just to, to do some control. We don't often have to spray, but there are times that you do. And we had a field at uh, Leftbridge that we darn sure had to spray. It was, it was just toasted. So, so any questions on app and turnip? Okay, the, the crop you see right here, um, and I just wanted to talk about the seeding here. And, and uh, I'm, I'm just not sure how this happened, but if you look at, at no competition in here, we should have had some pretty good establishment but you definitely see some tire tracks that run here and here which meant it was compacted and there was zero results when you look at the competition and you see the rolls that flourish on through you have to wonder why we didn't have a more solid response within our plots and maybe ken can speak to that i think it's the tillage effect so as you're seeding the pathways with winter wheat yeah it's actually loosening up the soil and bringing up moisture for for seeding and, and our corn over there, this year, our, our tilled plots just look so much better than our, our zero till yep. plots. I think yep. we ended up with some pretty hard soil this year. And obviously this one was seeded quite late, so we really missed the moisture window to get a... Yeah, we did. And I would like to, I mean, if we do this again, I'd sure like to stretch it out a long, you know, further ways, and I think you'd see some, some better results. Uh, but, but it's interesting just to look at, when you get to these kind of seeds, they're very small seeds. Uh, and so when you're dealing with very small seeds, very shallow moisture is, of course, becomes more and more critical and important. Remember I talked about clovers and the fact that I wasn't impressed as we went through uh, some of the clovers that we were currently playing with, and they all have a purpose. I was just looking at something that was going to be established in a stand that was going to provide some late fall grazing. And, and so we came across this, and it's called Balanza Clover and it's, uh, the name is Fixation. And this is a pretty unique clover in that it's probably, and it is, the only clover that's going to uh, uh, take up to minus five degrees centigrade in frost. So it's something that I thought would fit into a lot of our grazing programs. Aside from that, uh, it's very viney. And so under the right conditions, this stuff will vine out to six, eight feet. Uh, super, super, super high relative feed value in excess of 200. And so when you look at the quality that this brings into a ration, it's, it's extremely important. So I like this and I like what I'm seeing here. Uh, remember this was seeded, Ken, May 30th, here guys, somewhere in there. So when you look at the growth we have here, um, you know, it, it's quite good and it's even spread out in through here as well. Now, if, you know, if, if this had better moisture and it kicked on, you still see a lot of new seedlings coming. I'm interested to see how this is going to perform. But definitely from a minus 5 degree centigrade deal, uh, I'm pretty excited about that. Um, tonnage is quite good as well. Um, so, you know, a lot different than a white or a red clover. Uh, definitely we can look for quite a bit better on the tonnage side as well. Uh, we move on now and we get to um, a variety that was brand new for us this year. We brought on two forage rapes. One was called Gorilla. And I didn't, we didn't put Gorilla in here. We used La Capo instead. And the reason we did this, this is a broadleaf, um, a, a brassica, a forage rape. Very, very high yielding. Um, well suited to either a silage or a pasture type scenario. The reason I like this and the reason we chose to, to ride with this variety was the fact that it's no uric acid 
and no glu uh, glucosinates. So when we look to putting it into a stand, we don't have to worry about that issue when it uh, comes to beef cattle. So again, it uh, uh, looks like a very strong yielder. Uh, and I like what I see here. This is a taproot. So you're gonna do some aeration and, and open up some of the channels as well. So I'm pretty impressed with, with how this has taken on. Uh, remember again, no moisture and, and uh, to me it looks, it looks quite good. Um, is that a hybrid brand? Or? No, no, this is not. Your fully cropping systems, are you establishing always in the spring or are you doing it like after a main crop? Well, a little of both and that's why when you look to that back sheet there's four different scenarios there but we, I just kind of try based on what the guy is doing so there's different scenarios. There's one is, is a double cropping. Some will actually wait and, and either take out a forage crop um, or if, if we've utilized a, a grass stand, it could be annual rye or whatever the year before or fall rye, we'll go ahead and spray that out and then we'll come back in about June or the start of July and especially on irrigation and set up our scenario for late fall grazing or, or strip or, or swath grazing. And, you know, I've, I've a couple corn guys and, and nothing against corn production. I mean, we sell it too, but when you look at the dollar value, you have to assess in your own operation how that works. And we've had, I've got a couple guys that have utilized corn production for grazing, which is, is not a great, uh, not a great crop source, unless you're going to go through the management source or the management practices, right? Um, because if you do a, a holiday grazing setup, like some of our ranchers do, and, and no disrespect. But if you do a holiday grazing setup, corn you have to realize is, is very high in nutrients in terms of the cobs. The leaves have got a fair amount of protein, the stalks, stalks are stalks, right? And so when you do, you practice the holiday method of grazing, uh, basically you turn them cows out in January, you bugger off, they're eating the highest quality feed there is. Then they go to the leaves, then they go to the stalk, and they're down to the bottom side of that plant when the nutrient requirements for gestation are the highest. And so that, in terms of a program, to me is not very effective. However, if you go through the practice of, of, um, of fencing and allowing them a very consistent ration every two or three days, now you've got something that works. But again, it, it's how much management you want to put into it to make it work. So as we move to Sorghum Sedan, uh, which is the next plot over, and I'm not sure why this plot looks the way it does. I was quite disappointed when I come out here. Typically, that's a crop that probably, in my opinion, has been underutilized. Um, this is a, a crop that will give you quite a bit of biomass. Uh, it's a cross between Sorghum and Sorghum Sedan. And so this crop uh, typically is a 50 to 55 day crop, at which time you're gonna cut just at the boot stage. And about 25 to 30 days later, you're gonna do another cut. And so when you look at the amount of biomass this product offers you, um, and it's very consistent in terms of the energy and the protein value. And so to me, uh, this is probably a crop that we've missed. And so we've had quite a few acres in Southern Alberta that people have used. Uh, with a lot of success. The one thing that's going to turn you off on this crop is it does have the possibility to collect prussic acid, which is basically cyanide gas. And so it will dissipate, but that's the first thing that scares cowboys away, saying, oh, I'm not going to use that. I'm a little worried about it. But it's only after a severe frost or if you have, uh, um, you know, if you don't get much growth to this plant, anything less than basically 18 to, tw uh, to 2 feet, that's when the risk of prussic acid is the highest. The minute you ensile this product, gone. Okay, and within 7 to 10 days after a frost, that prussic acid is, is evaporated as well. And so, I hold a lot of respect for this crop. I think as we look forward for the cattle guys, I think it offers something. It's a warm season crop. So it's, it's difficult to get established if you seed it too early. Uh, definitely likes that soil temp of plus 10 and above. Uh, weed control is quite easy on the broadleaf side. That's not an issue. Um, 
The other thing with sorghum sedan is it's extremely palatable. The, the plants are very, very sweet. Uh, this is different than a sorghum plant that has a big stalk, much like corn. This has actually got the BMR, it's a brown midrib, and it's got the, the six gene in it, which means that, that in terms of the amount of lignin in the stem, it's about 10% less than a normal plant. This is a hybrid. And the other thing is, when you go to digestibility, about 20% higher than a normal sorghum sedan. And I mean, we sell the normal one as well, uh, but this is referred to as a dry stock. So again, when you look to the end use, uh, when you do your planning, that's something you have to look at as well. Any questions on sorghum sedan? So I know the guys have been growing that for 15 plus years now. What is holding it back? It, it just hasn't taken off. Well, it hasn't, and, and corn is going to outyield this for sure when it comes to a silage crop. Uh, if you have the opportunity to graze this, then that's where it shines. So if you even silage the first crop, graze the second, big benefit. You don't see the regrowth on corn, right? You don't see it on sorghum either. Oh, big time. Yeah. Yeah, big time. So that's why I cut at the boot. Don't let it get to be seven feet tall because it will. I mean, I had a field last year just outside of Chin that, you know, it was about eight and a half feet tall. It was unbelievable. And I've got pictures I can show you. Um, they took a cut on it and then the regrowth was probably three feet tall. You know, so it has the potential, but if, if you're not set up to graze it, so is that the major restriction is guys just don't want to graze? And prussic acid. People are just, they're terrified of that. It's like nitrates. I mean, I've been in this business a while. I started with Rob in extension. We always talk about nitrates. I've seen one nitrate case in, in the short 10 years that I've been involved, right? A little longer than that. But. <laughs> so again, it's, it's a matter of timing. It's a matter of, of getting the cattle set up. You don't turn them out on an empty stomach, same as you don't do in any of this stuff, right? You gotta have a full stomach as you go out, you get some conditioning. I mean, typically products take anywhere from 45 to, to 70 hours to work through the rumen system. So depending on the quality of feed, it'll determine how quick the passage rate is. So again, it's a blending deal, right? I gotta be hard on you, just because yep. I, maybe, maybe I can learn something here. The, um, when people say the word balanced, it like really makes a red flag go up for me. You hear it in crop production, oh well, it didn't have a balanced nutrition package. And you talked about a balanced feed ration. What exactly does that mean? And is it just a fancy term that people use to say, you know, to make excuses, quite frankly? No, 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 absolutely not. Balance is, is very critical when it comes to beef nutrition or horse nutrition, whatever you want to do. You want to feed the correct level of nutrients and that's what we're doing. So if you have something that's extremely high in carbohydrates or energy value, this is going to have a very quick movement through the rumen system. So and which there, numbers on the feed test are you talking about then? Uh, your energy value, the yeah. TDN. TDN. Yeah, TDN and protein. This is a lot of these kind of crops are going to be in that 24 to 28 percent protein. That animal can't utilize that heavy a protein level. So the first thing it does is it creates a diarrhea. And, and I mean, you're shooting that out and it's going on the ground, you ain't getting nothing out of it. So by balance, you wanna bring that down. So you wanna utilize some grasses within, within a brassica mix like this to kind of bring your, and balance your ration so it's not so high in energy and not so high in protein. Cause they have to be able to utilize it. No different than if we're on irrigated pasture, those cattle often will get loose on you. So you're shooting a lot of those nutrients out. Very often we'll put straw in, in round bale feeders just to try balance our ration out. We give them a poor quality feed along with the good quality feed they're, they're grazing just the slow rate of passage down in the room so they don't excrete all that that lands up back on the ground. Well, I'm a cow, I've got some crap in a bale and I've got the nice stuff. Does it work? It does. Yeah? It does. They'll go and they'll, they'll seek that out and I think it's the same as as if you load up on a bowl of cherries at night, you get a belly ache. you look for something that's a little different. So them cattle are actually, you think they're pretty stupid, but they got a little wisdom going on. You see it a lot in older cattle. Yes. Not, the heifers, not so much. They, they'll sit and they'll eat until they fall over on, on the green stuff. But all those old cows, if you have them out on that nice wet prairie grass and they, you throw a straw bale out for them, they're at it and they're, it's gone. They'll so basically balance of um, 
protein and fiber is the, right. That's what the balance is. Yeah. No, no different than a human. You you have to have a balanced diet. You have to eat all different things. You can't just eat protein. You can't just eat carbs. Right. Same that's thing for good. an animal. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can. The other problem that we have with Nebraska is that have become evident, and and some people have really you know have recommended. Uh, a higher level of brassicas. And I had a producer last year, not very far from us, that we got shit ass lucky because he went into a straight Vivian uh, forage brassica stand right there. And I can show you pictures, unbelievable, the growth, um, but never had one issue. We've had other guys that this product will collect sulfur. And the problem that occurs when you collect sulfur is you affect feed intake. And the minute you do that, you also tie up some of the other trace minerals. And so we ended up starving those cows from the inside out. And so thus the importance of not getting very wild on brassicas, making sure that you have something else in your stand to complement that back to the balanced ration. Okay, anything else on this? Brian, can you use the sorghum as a, a dry feed to bale it up? Yeah. You yeah, you can. I mean, I just worked with a guy from Tabor yesterday that's just putting in 320 acres. Um, if, if you're going to try to do this, again, dry stock is the answer just because of the bit of less lignin in the stem. It doesn't fall over. It still stands, but dry down is, is tough. Uh, guys silaging, uh, you're in that 72% range when you cut it because it's quite lush. It's in the boot stage. Um, once you cut it, you're probably looking at about 48 hour dry down time. So it takes a while to come back out of it. Biggest problem on irrigation with sorghum uh, is getting it off that it's dry enough. Yeah, sorghum sedan. Sorghum sedan, not sorghum. Like I would never recommend sorghum unless it's going in a pit. So, I mean, we have other options now. I mean, Bruce said Ag Plus has just got a bale tuber now. You know, if you look at at putting it in at a moisture level of 40 or 50 percent, here's the deal. Okay, extremely palatable. You put it in at a higher moisture level in a tube, and away you go. So you're bagging bales, is that? Yes. What yeah. yeah. You're silaging it then. Basically. Yes, you are. Yeah. At a lower uh, moisture, I mean, it's not 65, which you're usually accustomed to. You're down at 45 to 50. So again, some real options. This will run you about $25 an acre to seed. So seeding rate on, good question Dustin, seeding rate on sorghum sedan on dry land is about 20 to 25 pounds an acre on irrigation, 30 to 35. Now in parts of the south, they go up to 45. Um, this runs you about a dollar or 140 a bag, right? Yeah, somewhere in there anyway. So that's kind of, pardon me? Yeah, somewhere in there. So that's kind of, no, it'd be less than that. One, 180, yeah, somewhere in there. So, yeah, and again, if you compare that to, uh, to oats, you're quite a bit more expensive in terms of seeding costs. If you compare it to barley, you're pretty close to three bushel, right? So, so again, um, I think it's got some potential. This is a crop, remember I talked about uh, Bersim clover, I tried it. We really liked it. It adds lots in terms of uh, uh, soil fixation, in terms of nitrogen fixation. Uh, the problem that we had is when the frost hits it, it's, uh, there's not a whole bunch left. So this is very similar to alfalfa. When we went shopping though, we found this variety and it's called frosty. And it, it's, it's the wrong term because it's definitely got no frost tolerance at all. But it's a pretty neat plant because this is bloat free. And the other thing that, that occurs with this variety of frosty is it's also, uh, it has the ability to grow alongside of alfalfa. So if you're weak on an alfalfa stand as an annual, you can go in and seed this and there's no, there's no impact from the old roots on the alfalfa or the alfalfa plants that are aged. So we're pretty excited about this. It looks very much like an alfalfa plant. In the U.S. when they're seeding alfalfa, they'll put 20% of this frosty in, and it actually jumps their yield by as much as 30%. I can't speak to that claim, it's just something that's in the literature. Uh, we'll try it and see, but I'm pretty excited about this actually. I think it's a pretty neat opportunity. Lots of times, if the stand is fading, um, and somebody calls up and I said, I need another year out of it, because that's pretty popular these days, is trying to extend um, 
uh, trying to extend the stand, this might have some merit. And especially, especially under irrigation, yeah. Only sand point is perennial, this is an annual. Oh, okay. Right. Is that an annual in, in those more tropical? No, it's actually a biannual. Oh, okay, got a few we can test that on. Yeah. So yeah, I, I can speak a lot about what we've done lately in terms of, of interseeding and overseeding, but, but this is kind of related to, uh, to polycropping. So we've used this in quite a bit of our stands. From the non-bloat perspective, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a desirable. Um, and as I said, looks very much like, like an alfalfa plant, has a tap root as well. So you've got some soil health uh, uh, attributes there as well. And, you know, and it's quite nutritive as well. So, balance. yeah, balance, I like it. Balance. All right. You know, just one of the things that can, so it's the uh, rhizobia for these species. And are, are some of these coming in as uh, pre-inoculated? They're all pre-inoculated, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, they're all pre-inoculated. Uh, so they're ready to go. These use they, they're, the clovers and bursim even I know is a is a unique rhizobia. Oh yeah, look at the top. Easy, easy. There's some nodules on that one. Yep, they have started already. You bet. That one we didn't see any nodules when Andy and I were looking. If you want to pass that around, you see the little nodule right on the root system there. Yeah, which is an issue, and, and I take it up with government. Um, when it comes to inoculants, we've got a real issue. When it comes to sisal milk, which milk vetch, trefoil, and sandfoin, there's nothing. Uh, and why we can't put the pressure on to, to come up with a temporary use is beyond me. We do it in chemicals. Uh, what's the, the holdback? What's the risk or concern in bringing it up? Because we know everybody's doing it anyways. Well, it is, but it's a peat-based. So as a company, and nothing against, nothing against being part of a company, but we can't put this product on and sell it to you. The reason is the shelf life is done. A peat base is very short. So, so we have to sell you the raw seed. You have to do it like we used to do it a few years ago and put it on and then go to seeding it. So, I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I'm part of a FIN, the Alberta Forage Industry Network, and so we've sent letters and you get, you get a note back from the Fed saying, what are you guys bitching about? It's all registered. You guys have a product. We don't. And so the products, there's, what's that? I'm confused. Uh, so am I. So am I. So are they. Because they say we have a product. We don't have a product. We have the peat-based stuff that is not registered here. So our, you know, like I said, we need, we need some help there for sure. Because, you know, and so now, I mean, everything we've ever been taught is you have to use an inoculant. And so, you know, you saw the, the plant right there, if you're gonna fix an. So now people are saying, well, maybe you don't need to have an inoculant. Maybe there's enough soil borne and that, that maybe it'll work, but is maybe what you wanna do when you're expanding $80 an acre on seed? Probably not. You want to be a little more firm as to what you're getting. Speaking of that, are there opportunities for seed production contracts for the irrigated farmers around? For? For any of this stuff. No, well, I mean, there is from time to time. Uh, you know, as you look to, as an example, alfalfa, we're probably at the highest acreage of alfalfa seed we've been at for years. And I mean, we have a contracting business. We grow our own uh, seed. And we also employ ranchers and farmers to do that. Um, you know, the, the amount of seed production that's actually happening and, and based on the years, we're looking as to a glut situation right now. If we have an average year in terms of, of alfalfa seed production, you can expect that price to drop dramatically. Brome looks like it's going to be a, a crazy yield this year. So again, you don't want to be long on brome. Um, so I, I think if you're to forecast seed production, unless we have some major hailstorms that go through, uh, you know, you're probably looking at a decline in pricing for sure. Now, a lot of, we spread our production over three, um, three provinces and, and some of our production will be Europe based and US based as well. But, um, yeah, I mean, this is still a pretty immature market. 
Yeah, just kind of growing. Where does the seed come from then? Is it grown here or is it? Uh, well, some and then lots comes out of that Oregon country, out of the U.S. Yeah. We have a contracting business. Part of our uh, part of our line is we export to almost every country, and and lots of it will either grow uh, forages for them and export it back, or or we have our own that we export. Sometimes they'll give a seed and they'll want us to replicate it and, and go into that. Like we'll grow, um, even in this area, uh, Enchant, Brooks, we'll have some fall dormancy sevens that will grow on alfalfa, for example. We'll never market them in Western Canada. They're not gonna work. But yet, we grow that, we replicate it, we sell the seed, it all heads to Europe. And so, when we talk about, and I, this is my plug to get her in, when you talk about GMO alfalfa, that's the worst thing in the world for us because Europeans won't accept anything and they test every single sample. And so, you know, when you think about that from a production standpoint, on our behalf, it doesn't work. When you think about it, if you're marketing uh, compressed hay, it doesn't work. Okay, any amount of, of, um, of Roundup residue is rejected. So we have to be careful what we ask for. Okay, that's my plug. All right, the next one is a hybrid brassica. This again, um, has got a bulb that doesn't, is kind of stays underground. Uh, it's a very high yielding, high producing uh, brassica that will fit into a stand as well. Very often we'll put a forage brassica in, uh, we'll use a forage rape and then one turnip and then mix it up with uh, could be uh, could be red prosum millet, could be German millet. We brought in Japanese millet this year, and the reason for Japanese is is extreme, uh, you know, fairly good levels of biomass production, the ability to grow in salt areas, the ability to grow in standing water. So when you look to parts of Manitoba and parts of Alberta, we've had some requests just because we need something to get rolling in that in those stands. So, so I think with that, I'm going to stop. Um, if you have any other questions, we'll entertain them. I'm, you guys are right near dinner. So with that, thanks, Ken, on behalf of Karen and myself for, uh, for doing the plot work for us. Thanks for coming. Sorry it doesn't look pretty here. <laughs> Brian, it's getting up fairly were, much consistent with all these. We did feed this with our bear feeders, too. Oh, did ya? Yeah. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Just it's all very small seed, so making sure you can get pretty shallow. Yeah, we're probably probably closer to half inch. Just. Yeah, and you want to try be a quarter inch. That's kind of the the rule of thumb. So, so when you get to things like Austrian field peas, they're huge, and so when you have a request from customers that come in and they say, "Well, this is what we want," well, you know, typically in a in a seeding situation, it's very difficult. So. A lot of people have gone to broadcast applications and, and Harrow pack it in a couple times and increase your seeding rate and typically we get pretty good response. So there's different ways to do it but very often too when, you, when somebody calls in for a blend I'll readjust that based on what seeding equipment they have because it, it's frustrating if, if all the f small seed settles out and all you've got left is peas your, your field doesn't look very uniform. So. Okay, any other questions? If not, on behalf of Karen and myself, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, get a hold of Karen. Um, she'll direct them to me or, or, uh, or you can call me directly. And enjoy the rest of your day.